our last essential question for the concept, five out of five. Why is the fossil record sequential in nature? And into the left-hand column we go. We are going to be talking about the sequential nature of the fossil record. So in your left-hand column, start with the sequential nature of the fossil record. Fossils are laid down in sequence. Older fossils are laid down before younger ones. This creates a sequential record of life on Earth. Fossils can be dated using rock sequences and by radiometric dating. In some cases, fossils are present in a complete sequence. Most often they're not, however, and unfortunately. Paleontologists are, however, often able to assemble sequences of rocks from different areas. In some other cases, there are gaps in the fossil record. And some of these gaps are marked by the apparent sudden appearances of new life forms. This fact that older fossils are laid down before younger ones, which we call the sequential nature of fossils, the sequential nature of fo the fossil record has allowed scientists to trace the evolution of groups back to their common ancestors. One example of this happening is the evolution of whales. Now, fossils formed over the last 60 million years suggest that whales evolved from a land-based ancestor. These fossils show a gradual transition between the, this land-dwelling ancestor and modern whales. Now, uh, Pachycetus, which is the, the, thought to be the ancient land-dwelling ancestor of the whales, was a carnivorous but semi-aquatic quadruped, meaning it has four legs. Semi-aquatic, so it would live in shallow water, typically freshwater habitats, shallow freshwater habitats. Now, it didn't look much like a whale, according to the fossil record, but its skull resembles those of modern whales. Specifically, the ear region is surrounded by thick bone, which is a characteristic that is only found today in whales. Now, this might be a small detail, but this minor detail, though it may be, has helped paleontologists connect together a series of fossils that are part of the whale evolutionary tree. Links in the evolution of this tree show a variety of species with intermediate body forms. One of those intermediate body forms, or a, a transitional fossil, it's another term you can use, is the more recent Ambulocetus, which dates about 48 million years ago. So, the body of Ambulocetus suggests that, that it was amphibious. Right? So, its forearms showed the features of a land animal. But its hind limbs, and it had a, a, a tail that would move back and forth, right? an undulating tail, were adapted for swimming. So, land-based forearms but the hind limbs and the tail were more adapted for swimming. Isotope analysis, which is a, a, a type of uh, testing, isotope analysis shows that it lived near shore marine habitats. So a chain of more recent fossils show a further transition to the whale-like body that doesn't have any legs, and it's better adapted for swimming. These intermediary organisms were able to live in the sea. Now, eventually, these populations evolved into what we uh, consider to be modern dolphins and baleen whales. So, while the fossil evidence indicates that these animals are relatives of each other, it does not provide, let's just say, conclusive evidence showing that one is the direct ancestor of the other. As we have mentioned uh, previously, there is increasing evidence in the fossil record that birds evolved from some small carnivorous dinosaurs, specifically the theropods. 
Now, Tyrannosaurus rex belonged to this group of dinosaurs. Now, this dinosaur-bird connection was first suggested after the discovery of a transitional fossil, right? Meaning transitional, it had uh, the characteristics of reptiles and birds at the same time. Now, this famous fossil is called Archaeopteryx, which means old wing or ancient wing. The fossil Archaeopteryx has been dated to about 150 million years ago. The fossil, which uh, you can see a representation of Archaeopteryx on the, on the screen here, the fossils show that Archaeopteryx had feathered wings and other features similar to birds. It also had a long bony tail, fingers with claws on it, and teeth, which are very similar to reptiles. Even more recent fossils show that some dinosaurs had feathers long before wings evolved. These early feathers probably functioned for insulation, right, to keep them warm. Uh, they were probably colored so that they could be used for display, like a, a like mating dance, or for camouflage. And some of these feathers were actually downy, like down feathers. Others were much stiffer, right? Other wings were much stiffer. Um, and so those are a little bit closer to what we would think of as the wings, uh, the, the feathers on the wings of birds. Now, fossils found in China and in South America show evolutionary changes in nesting behavior. They also show changes in feathers, jaws, and the skeletons, right? Specifically that connect the, dino uh, the feathered dinosaurs to modern birds. Whales and birds, like we just talked about, are two examples of how the sequential nature of fossils can be used to build up an idea or a picture of evolutionary history. This is Germanodactylus, one of 150 species of pterosaurs discovered. These flying reptiles are not dinosaurs. The fine skin stretches over their elongated fingers to create leathery wings. This membrane, along with powerful muscles and hollow bones, makes them masters of the skies. Pterosaur's aerial supremacy is about to be challenged by the very first birds, such as Archaeopteryx. A primitive bird whose claws are the ends of its wings. Archaeopteryx was certainly no acrobat, but it had feathers and it could fly. Its collarbones had already fused together, a vital step enabling the wings to flap efficiently and gain altitude, allowing it to hunt and nest in trees. One thing that we can see from the fossil record is that evolution is not a smooth process. And by smooth process, I mean it takes place slowly, and one organism will again very slowly transform into another form, another organism. And that takes place over millions of years. That doesn't seem to be the case all the time. Now, for example, there are organisms that existed completely unchanged successfully for millions of years. But then all of a sudden, they undergo an apparently rapid evolution, meaning they change very, very quickly over a short amount of time. An example of this is the evolution of uh, a group of protists called Foraminifera. Uh, it's a group of single-celled protists. Now, over the last 10 million years, the Foraminifera underwent a series of relatively fast morphological changes, right? Changes to their, their body shape, their, their structure. And then, and then they would go into a long period of stasis, meaning not a lot of change. This pattern fits in well with current ideas of evolution. 
So within an isolated population, genetic drift and natural selection can result in very fast, rapid evolution. But it may leave no fossil record. The reintroduction of the changed population to the wider population may then lead to a sudden appearance in the fossil record, which breaks this long period of stasis. Now, one thing that all scientists agree on is that there are gaps in the fossil record. Some of these gaps have been filled in by missing links or transitional fossils. Other gaps are still there and unexplained. But because the fossil record is incomplete, scientists also rely on things other than fossils, things like molecular, genetic, or anatomical evidence to support the different theories of evolution. These are nice principles, but let's, let me give you a demonstration of this. Right. Imagine, if you, were, if you will, that this is a deposit of sediments, and this little ant farm-like deposit is an ancient landscape. A landscape populated by prehistoric humans. And, oh, this guy's just going to hunt a rhino with a spear. You know what happens when, when that occurs? This guy dies. Okay? <laughs> the rhino goes along for 10 more years. He dies. An elephant comes along. Well, another idiot decides to take on the, the mammoth with you no know, tools in his hands. He's, he's dead. But eventually, the mammoth runs out of gas. He's dead, too. The saber tooth tiger comes in here, looks for nothing, no, no dead humans, no, no or carcasses. 15 years later, he buys the farm. Now, a volcano erupts, covers these deposits with ash. There we go. And another civilization arises, a, a civilization populated by the people of the Hello Kitty tribe. <laughs> They're bopping along and you know, fighting. And they do the head bonking contest. And, Double elimination. Their, their pet gorilla wanders by. Oh, what happened to the Hello Kitty people? Oh, and 10 years later, oh, I'm out of food. No more bananas. There you go. And they're succeeded by a population of robots. All over the space of another century or so. And then another, another uh, volcano erupts, covering the place with black ash. All right. Now, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. We're archaeologists. We keep things simple. What we have here is the principle of superposition and the principle of association. The older deposits are lower in the sequence, the younger ones are higher up. The objects that were deposited at the same time are enclosed within the same sediment. Now, when I say at the same time, I don't mean at exactly the same time. Here's the little weasel words. When we turn, we, in geology, when we say deposited at the same time, meaning they're enclosed in the same sediments, that means they were deposited by the same geological event, the same depositional event. Some of those individuals could have died days, months, years, decades, even centuries apart. So at the same time is a very fungible concept. It's a nice principle. That'll do it for today's lecture. At this point, you should be able to answer today's essential question, why is the fossil record sequential in nature? Now that you can do that, please look back through your notes and write your answer to today's essential question. Write that answer in the summary box at the bottom of your notes.